Welcome to the Swim Swim Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very special guest. He just qualified for the 2021 Olympics in the 100 and 200 meter breaststroke. He is the Dutch breaststroking machine. He broke, he's, he's broken countless records in the 50, 100, and 200 short course and long course breaststroke. We've got Arno Kaminga. Arno, how's it going? Well, hello. Yeah, going pretty well after this weekend, so I uh, can't <laughs> complain. <laughs> Let's start with that. You, this is your first Olympic team, right? Yes. Uh, four years ago, I wasn't that serious into swimming, and mm. I think I missed it with like 0.8 of a second, which is pretty huge in swimming. But back then, it was like, oh damn, just missed it. <laughs> but it, it feels great to be on the Olympic team right now. Yeah. Yeah. Does I mean was that was missing the Olympic team by 0.8? kind of a catalyst for you getting more serious about your swimming uh well before that i missed the european juniors with 0.1 of a second mm. and also in 2016 i missed uh europeans by 0.1 or 0.2 so I had, a, I had a couple of misses so that but that really kept me going to to push even harder and further because i really wanted to make like the big international meets yeah. And so, uh, tell me, tell me about the meet this weekend, um, heading into it, you know, obviously it's been a, a pretty wild year for everyone. Um, but how did you feel heading into this and were you confident that you could, you know, qualify for this Olympic team? It was kind of weird. Like normally I race a lot, like uh, maybe I, I race the most, like in the entire world, every two weeks, I normally have like a competition. And this year there are like kind of no competitions. So I think since this summer, I only had two, which is kind of weird because uh, normally I'll just like rest more after competitions and then I get better and better. Mm -hmm. And here it was like, I came out of like a really tough training uh, period. So it was kind of weird. I felt great. I felt amazing, but it's always like, if you come out, uh, out of a really long training, comp uh, uh, training block, it's always like a, either a hit or a miss. So that's also what I said to my coach, like, all right, this weekend it's going to be a hit or a miss, but no matter what, this is like our standard for the next coming months. So let's see what we have in the, what we have in the tank. Yeah. And I mean, you hit right off the bat, a really historical time, you know, 206 and the 200 breasts has, has become certainly more common than it was a few years ago, but that's still, of, uh, I mean, did you think, you had that in the tank? Uh, well, I was going for the 206 longer now, especially since in March, just before lockdown, I swam at 207 one. So I knew like 206 is, is within reach. But this was like the first real competition since March where I was fully arrested and fully like committed to, to going to sub 207. Uh, so it still came as a, as a shock that I was like this in shape and, 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 and it went this well, but like, I, I knew it, I had it in me. I mean, that's, it's, it's super exciting to see someone go that fast. And especially like you said, after chasing a goal like that for a while, I'm sure it felt great. And so, um, you know, you, you said today was kind of a long recovery day. How, how are you feeling just in the couple of days after knowing you've made this Olympic team? Uh, well, I was already like sort of qualified because we have multiple meets to qualify for the Olympics. So after World Championships 2019, uh, I already qualified in the 200. And then last year in December in Amsterdam, I qualified in the 100. Um, and we have it set up in this way. So after this competition, everyone who qualified with the time and in the top two, is their spot is secure. And then the open spots are left. We have two more. Uh, we have another swing cup and the European championships where people still can qualify. So like I knew I was qualified, but not 
like officially and well since since yesterday i'm now officially qualified so yeah it feel, feels really really good congratulations that's <laughs> that's pretty Thank awesome you. um and so so let's get into that lockdown like you said you're used to train or racing a lot which i want to hit on in a bit um but let's you know i've asked everyone these past nine months have been unlike pretty much anyone on earth has ever seen um what have they been like for you especially someone who is used to racing so much to be honest pretty boring <laughs> uh like i love racing i love traveling i love seeing all the people on the in the international stage so going back to just the basics training day in day out was was pretty boring time to time but like the the first few months were pretty fine i guess like it was hard getting into the water um but i was still on a high after uh hitting those big times in in march in in antwerp so i was feeling really good i feeling really motivated and i think like during the the summer the end of summer was the hardest time because then we finally knew okay competition's gonna take a long gonna take a while before like competition's gonna start up and we have big competition again and we can travel again and practice was pretty boring at the time long meter stuff training so i think like during summer it was was the hardest of all and then the last couple of months we went back into more racing although it was in practice but it was racing again so that made me feel great and for the last couple of weeks uh we also had some training camps uh abroad so that was also really good uh, change of sen- sen- scenery um so it's been going pretty well like ups and downs like everyone has but like not too bad yeah i'm you know if 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 we can get into it just emotionally how was that for you even just motivation wise i mean i know you said you know four years ago you weren't as serious about swimming and you like the travel you like seeing people i mean was was that hard to even drag yourself to the pool knowing that none of that was really on the horizon? Uh, not really. Like my, my dream was of course making the Olympics and going to the Olympics. Uh, but that was postponed. And then I knew, okay, I'm going to just focus on next year. But then again, like my, my focus isn't entirely just solely on, on the Olympics, but also on worlds and euros. Mm-hmm. So I could, changed pretty quickly and i was like all right but i don't want to be like at the top in, at just the olympics i want to be fast off the olympics as well so that really kept me going because i want to be better and better every single day um but yeah i had my downs like everyone else has uh especially uh after the summer we had some competitions which were then uh, canceled again during lockdown so that was a pretty rough time uh, because we we're really looking forward to to racing again um, it was fine after all i guess <laughs> yeah a, a long drawn out fine <laughs> um, yeah. it's, a, it's a good way to put it you know because because i'm sure you know there, there were people who had had it worse off and you know, it's, it sounds like you were still able to train and stay in shape and, and chase those goals, which is, which is really nice. Um, but you know, yeah. So overall fine, which is cool. Um, yeah. Like we, uh, training wise, once we get back in the pool, it was pretty cool. Like our federation put together some, some real strict protocols, but since we got back into pool, we didn't have to even when the pools were closed like two months ago, we could still swim. So that was really good. And yeah, I, I'm used to having like uh, losses and, and, and not making teams. So I was used to getting, uh, I, I'm used to having it not my way. So that was like an easy, easy adjustment for me. I mean, we did, we discussed it at the beginning a little bit, but uh, I mean, tell me about some of these losses or, or not having it your way. Did again, has this, has this been a theme in your swimming career? Has this really shaped you? 
Uh, well, before my swimming losses, uh, I lost my mom when I was 15. Uh, so that was a, yeah, the, the biggest loss you, you can have. Yeah. Uh, but that really set me up into swimming. Like I, I had really nice friends at swimming. And uh, I think two days after her passing away, I was back into the pool just to have some distraction. Uh, but that's probably the moment I started like realizing, okay, I want to, go further into swimming and get a little bit serious mm -hmm. uh, and then I miss the European juniors and the, the normal uh, Europeans and the Olympics and I was like oh, damn like I'm always like one step behind um, so that really set me up into like all the successes I have right now because I know what the other side of the of the coin is that's that's a really good perspective to have i feel like um, i mean obviously like you said that's a huge loss but that 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 shows you like you said what the other side of that coin is do you why did you decide okay swimming like this is really what i want to do was it because that was kind of a coping mechanism or i mean what what drew you to swimming particularly uh well in the beginning it was just the good friends and I was used to it, just going to the pool like everyone else. But then like after a while, I was like, all right, I want to see like how far I can come. I can push myself. I, I saw it as a, as, a, as a good like competition for myself. Like, okay, how far can I go? And also I tried, uh, I tried to study here, but it's in the Netherlands, it's pretty, pretty rough to, to combine studying and, and swimming. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, so one year I said that was after the Olympics in 2016, I said to myself, okay, this year, I'm not going to start a study. I'm just going to swim for one year. And if I make a team for world Budapest, it was, mm -hmm. uh, then I know I'm good at swimming and then I'll, I'll just like keep on swimming. And if I don't make it like, okay, I, I tried it and I can move on with my life. So that was like a big, big thing, like in my career. And what, what makes it hard, you know, that's, that's a really different perspective than, um, you know, I'm in the U S and obviously the NCAA system is huge here. The, you know, lots of people do college and swimming. What makes it difficult in the Netherlands? Um, why was that, you know, a challenge to balance? So we train here in a, in a national team setting mm. and the universities, like you're not swimming for your university. So basically they don't really care what you do besides your study they just like say be here then and then and and make your exams and pass them uh which is really hard if you like i think last season i was like 200 days abroad with all the training oh, scams wow. and competitions so i was like yeah the, you just can't combine those two here yeah <laughs> okay yeah so that's that's a lot not yeah not as conducive for sure um, so, so you make that 2007 world's team, sorry, 2017 world's team, uh, what events, was it the 50 breast? Is that right? Uh, for, uh so in December, 2016, mm -hmm. I had a five second PB in my 200. <laughs> so I went from 215 to 210, which was huge. And like, I didn't even like expect it. So that was really nice. And that, what, that really set me up. So at Worlds, I swam the 50, 100, and 200. Okay. I had a semis at the 100 and 200 and a three-way swim-off in the 50. So that was also <laughs> pretty epic. <laughs> Wait, do you remember who the swim-off was with? Yeah, there was this Russian guy, uh, Senko, and I think it was with the Slovenian, Peter Stevens. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm looking at that now. That's, that is, like you said, that's pretty epic. <laughs> yeah. Three way swim off. Like, not even a normal swim off. It was like a, a three way swim off. So, you're like, yeah. <laughs> Bucket <That's> list check. <laughs> right. So, it's pretty cool. Not many people get to do that. Um, so, so you, you go to this world's meet, three way swim off to semifinals. I mean, it, did, did how you swam have a bigger impact or just being at a meet of that level? have a bigger impact for you i think both so i had like my, my goals swimming sub 210 and sub minutes and mm -hmm. i both achieved those uh, but i think it was more like being there 
knowing like how amazing it is to swim at this level. So I was like, all right, this was pretty amazing. Also like Budapest with, with the stands completely full. Oh, I still got chills from it. Uh, <laughs> so that was pretty epic. And, I, and from that moment on, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm turning the heat up. Like I want to be better and better. What surprised you most about being at a meet of that, of that stature and size? Uh, I think like seeing all the big names where you already like watch for years and years on television and then you're just standing next to them or, or even swimming against them is pretty damn epic. <laughs> and then also like beating some names who are, who are like years and years into the scene and then you're like, okay, I'm the new boy and, and <laughs> beating them is, it's, yeah, that, that, that feels amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, I can imagine did when you were growing up, you know, like you said at 15, you're like, okay, I'm going to give this a go. I mean, did you have heroes in the sport or, or athletes that you looked up to? Uh, well, I think, uh, on top of everybody's list is like Michael Phelps, which is pretty epic in, in Beijing. Uh, but I, I really remember the, the hundred breaststroke in London with Cam, Cameron Vandenberg. Uh, so he was, he was like a huge, huge, uh, uh, idol for me and it was pretty epic to swim against him for the first time I think it was 2015 he came to the Netherlands oh, and nice. he's such a nice guy so that was like all right I want to be like that <laughs> <laughs> that's that is really cool he we had him on the podcast at some point and yeah he's such a nice guy he's so friendly so charming um he really is yeah and so you swim at this 2017 worlds and then were you, were you always a breaststroker? Uh, yeah. Like maybe when I was 10, I did a little bit of butterfly, but like my kicks aren't, aren't that great. So I changed quickly into breaststroke. And I think like from age 12 or 13, I've, I've been a breaststroker. Uh, I mean, what, what do you enjoy about breaststroke or what do you, you know, is it the feel for you? Is it the kick for you? I mean, what do you, what do you like about breaststroke? What I really like is if you watch like an Olympic final, you see like eight different kinds of breaststroke. Like it's so personal, like one has a big glide. The other has, has like a, a, a short glide. One has like a big kick. The other has a small kick and just like, finding out which like style suits you and, and, and perfecting that is, I, I think that that's, that's really a beauty of breaststroke. Agreed. I think that is the beauty of breaststroke that it's just like, you, that's a great way to put it. It's so personal. Um, what would you say your style of breaststroke is? I mean, what are you focusing on as of late? I see myself as a little bit of everything. So I don't think I'm the strongest or the or or the best in anything, but I think I can combine like all the different aspects really well, and I, I'm I can swim really efficient. Um, so I think like all those things combined, I can uh, I can push like further than than anyone else. That's that's exciting, and uh, I make. I'm excited to see where that goes moving forward. So you go to 2017 worlds, you, you get your first big international experience there. And then it seems like you just kind of, you just kind of came onto the scene. I mean, I remember last year, 2019, you between 2019 and 2020, you broke over 10 Dutch records in breaststroke events, short course and long course. And it was just like, Whoa. I mean, like you said, you were racing all the time. You were improving time after time. When did you find out that racing so much was going to, was going to be good for you? Well, I've always raced a lot. Even when I was like back at the club, when I was 15, I raced really a lot. And I, I always used all the races up until like the big meet, which really helped me. But I think like after the summer of 2019, so I knew I was already qualified for the Olympics. And then we went on training camp to Rome and I sat down with my coach there and we were like, okay, let's, let's try like something new. Let's just step the game up. Let's be more focused than ever. Let's, let's be more professional than ever. And we went 
from that training camp straight into the World Cups. And without having rest, I swam PB is like every single meet up until like I got finally rested at, at the European short course. So, but I, well, I was really shocked like that, that I, I could like swim PBs without taper. I mean, and it's, that's, that's such an interesting thing. I think this is the new, I mean, I think in 10 years, everyone's going to be doing this. And I could, you know, I could be wrong, but I think this is the new direction of swimming, especially with the ISL, right? I mean, like we saw in the Budapest bubble, people were going PBs every week or people were improving, right? Every, every single week and they were racing again and again and again. And so it's so interesting. Like, how do you manage training? Because I mean, in the U S at least there's this mindset of, okay, you, you train really, really hard for months, right? And then you taper and then you have the one big meet. Um, how do you manage training when you're racing every two weeks? And like you said, going PBs every week, every two weeks. So that's all also like how up until a few years ago, they thought how it went in the Netherlands. So always mm -hmm. train a lot, don't do a lot of competitions. Um, but I think like when my coach came here, so I always liked doing competitions and my coach came here and he was like, yeah, uh, we're going to do a lot of competitions. I like that. So the competition is the best practice. Mm. Um, so we started doing that and it took me a while to adjust to swim really fast and also believe I could swim fast, like during in season uh, competitions. Um, but then we, we started doing that. And then I, I started like looking at competitions as practice. And I had to swim down like sometimes like two, three K after each me uh, after each swim. So especially with like the FINA champions series, which was mm -hmm. like fly in on one day, have, have one day of practice, then swim two days and fly back. So especially during those competitions, I had to like swim a lot during and in between races. That's really interesting. Uh, I mean, yeah, again, you think of warm down, you think of like, oh, at 400 or an 800 or something, but it's like two or three K you really, you, like you said, you start thinking about it very professionally and very seriously. Um, and so then, you know, unlike a world cup circuit, what do you do on the days that you're not racing? You know, it's like, do you have hard practices or what do you, you know, even if, I mean, you have to go fast, I assume, at some points. So, like, what do you focus on during those days when you're practicing and not racing? Um, so, mostly, we, we, we just do basic endurance stuff. So, slow swimming, just work on your on your technique and your drills. And because the fast, fast swimming is in the races, and I do a lot of races. So, like, I only need, like, the, the easy swimming in between, mm -hmm. which I really like. Uh, but then again, once in a while, my coach like drops like a, a, a intensive uh, endurance set in between there just to like shake up the body a bit. <laughs> nice. And so tell me, yeah, tell me about this past. So, well, the fall of 2019, you started at World Champs uh, in July in Guangzhou, where you went 208.4. And then between the World Cups, between different events, Euro short course champs, um, Swim Cup Amsterdam, you just kept <laughs> lowering. Um, I mean, just tell me about that stint, um, where you were mentally, where you felt physically, and, and how you moved through those few months. I think during World Championships, I was ready for a final, but it just like didn't come out. So I was really, especially during the 100, I didn't swim uh, my, my season best. I didn't swim my personal best. And I was like a bit disappointed. I also didn't qualify there. Uh, so the 200 was like a big bounce back to qualify for the Olympics. I was 10th, um, but I just like, just missed out on the final. But I knew I had more in me. So that's where we stepped up and then like, I knew mentally I was ready for more, but just like it, it didn't really come out. So I discussed a lot with my coach and with, with friends and, and just like, okay, how, how are we going to take the, the next step? Like, 
what what do we need to do? Like this is the Olympic season. Like we want to be that that one guy who nobody knows about, and then you just come out of nowhere. Uh, so we 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 talked a lot about it, and then in October during the World Cup in Budapest, I swam PB in all all three events, and I was like, "What's this? Like I'm tired as hell from from like three weeks training in Rome, and and I swam PB. It's like, what's this?" Uh, and then I also like I I've never even won a World Cup an event. And then I I after like Budapest Berlin I even won the cluster and I was like, what what is this? <laughs> okay, uh, so I have it in me and I really started believing in myself from then. And I think that's a huge huge change. That's yeah, that seems like it would make a difference. And uh, do I so again yeah you broke. Uh, short course records you broke long course records do you have a preference of short course or long course uh, i think long course we also practice like nine nine out of ten times long course hmm. uh, so that I, I i think long course is way way better uh, especially the short course breaststroke is so different from long course breaststroke uh, especially in the sprint uh, but yeah, i prefer long course Gotcha. What what do you, what do you like about long course versus short course? I think long course you really need to be like the specialist. You need to be the breaststroker instead of the the turn guy or the pull out guy or uh, or the butterfly kicker like a lot of people do right now. Uh, and long long course you just you you can't get away with it. Like you need to be really good at swimming. <laughs> and and you re- you need to be really good at breaststroke, and that that's what I really like. Mm. Yeah, that that makes sense. <laughs> um, so I mean, so speaking of short course, I mentioned the ISL earlier. Did you ever consider being a part of the ISL this season? Uh, yes, like, like both seasons. Um, mm. But then again, yeah, there was Corona, COVID, and I was like. Yeah, I, I need to be careful with my body. And I was talking to a few of the teams and I was like, this is not really what I want. Like, I want to do the competitions, but like all the, the practice in between, it's not really my thing. So then I sat down with my with my coach, Mark Faber, and, and we were like, all right, let's 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 just like cut the rope, make a decision. Let's like make an own plan, uh, which we can like adjust and so we did two training camps, one in Rome again, and one in Gloria, uh, Gloria Sports Arena. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that worked out pretty well. So I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you said the practices in between the competitions weren't really your thing. What I mean, what made you say that? Just because, and maybe maybe this is hindsight, maybe, I don't know, um, you know, it seemed like everyone had kind of their own personal plan while they were in the bubble and they were kind of doing their own thing. Um, what what was unappealing about that for you? Um, well, here in the Netherlands, like it's it, we have perfect facilities. So uh, I, I can't even remember the last time we had to circle in, the, in, in, in our lane. Like normally uh, I train alone <laughs> in like a 50 meter lane, maybe two. Uh-huh. Um and and just like we have a camera system and and it, it's it's like perfect training here mm-hmm. um so i didn't really need to go to the isl as badly as some people who didn't have like any water to training mm-hmm. um so that was like i was like yeah let, let's just train at home like then i can really do my own thing then i have my own coach and we can really like work on the things we we worked like the past couple of months Makes sense. So when you go to a meet, is a is the warm up pool just your worst nightmare? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> because I don't swim during warm up like ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I always have like my, my own mat and then I have my own space like during warm up. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how warm or cold the pool is or how crowded. Like my my warm up is always the same. <laughs> So so wait so you don't get in the warm up pool while the other people are swimming? Mm-hmm. I, I just like do some dry lens and that's it. Okay, and then and then you're ready to race. Yep. 
<laughs> so I've been I've been doing that for six, seven years now, and I've been really perfecting it. And even like for a two hundred, I don't swim it. That's wild to me. Was I mean? T- tell me about it. What's what's your routine? How have you perfected it? Uh, well, it, it started with a joke, actually. So <laughs> we always do drylands before swimming in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one day during a practice, our coach said, okay, we're going to do a 25 cold turkey from the block. And I was like, the, the week before we did it with warm up, and then we did it like with only the drylands. And I was like mm-hmm. half a second faster on like a 25. I, I made a huge PB and I was like, how? <laughs> so that's where it started. And then like I started to, talking to like the our strength and conditioning coach and our, my my coach and and our physio like okay what's what 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 are the things i really need to do and nowadays like i start like an hour before my race i do some yeah yoga stuff and then at the end some more like uh, uh i don't i don't know how to call it like more the the stuff to get your your body like warmer um and that that's pretty much about it like i just know what to do i know how uh, how hot my body needs to be before my race and 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 it's perfect like because I, I, as i said like sometimes the pool is really cold and people are complaining about it or really crowded and i'm like yes good luck <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's it seems smart i think that's fascinating because we really don't i mean i've i've talked to one um, other American who, who doesn't really warm up, but she swims the 50 freestyle and, you know, you, you swim up to the 200. I, I, I see some 50 freestylers doing it, but mm-hmm. it, and, and always, if people talk to me, like, you're not doing it for a 200, what <laughs> are you crazy? And I'm like, no, nah, it's fine. Has, I mean, has anyone asked you about it in terms of like, oh, I, I want to try this or has this trend caught on among your social circles? uh not really like i i think most of of my team does some dry lands uh but they also combine it with swimming mm-hmm. uh i know jesse putts only does for a 53 doesn't swimming mm-hmm. uh but i think that's about it like you, because you need to be really confident like not touching the water before your race <laughs> And for me, that's not a problem. Like I know uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be fine. But like for people at this level to start with it, it's I think it's really really rough. Agreed. Uh, yeah, like you said, that seems it seems like the key to it would be knowing that it's gonna work, and that seems like a big transition. Um, but like again, it's super interesting because every pool is different. Like you said, sometimes it's really cold. Sometimes it's it's long sometimes it's short and uh that this way you 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 control all the variables right yeah so normally i'll, I'll swim just like the day before so i know the pool i know where the where the mm. stripe stripes are on the bottom and and i know how warm a cold pool is but mm-hmm. then again like before my race i'm just like i can really focus on my own thing i, I just find a quiet place to, to lay down and and do my thing awesome <laughs> sorry i'm just trying to take it yeah, in. i think fun. that's that's so cool and it's um, also really like I, I can do it on my own like i don't need a coach doing warm-up to get like uh, uh, all, all the all the times or the splits i can just like i'm like all right i see you in like 30 minutes and then <laughs> i do my own thing and then only just before the race i see him and then i'm like okay i'm gonna do this and this and then and then i'm off to race nice and then, so you do warm down though. You cool down, right? After yeah, the yeah. race. Yeah. Um, so, and that's where I mostly swim a little bit more because I don't swim in. So I can easily do a little bit more doing warm down, mm. which is extra helpful for recovery. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you, do you feel like your body reacts best? So like, you do your physical warm up before your race, you swim the race, and then do your does your body feel better after the race having not been in the pool before, or do you think that produces well, more lactic acid or I have no clue because I haven't swum in six <laughs> years, so I don't know 
what normal people feel but like this works for me and i swim really fast and and i'm like comfortable with this i'm like no nah, i don't want to change back touche all right i'm gonna i'm gonna stop talking about this now <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> so it's just let's talk about you know warm down and recovery um since you started taking your sport as seriously as you do you know as you said taking it really professionally um how important has the, has the recovery side been just as opposed to like, you know, the training and working really hard? Uh, well, it's really important. And I think that's one of my, my biggest key components into my success. So I can sleep a lot, <laughs> really a lot. So I can easily sleep 12 hours at night. If, if I have the morning off, I can easily s- sleep like two or three or four or five hours in the afternoon uh-huh. uh, depending on if i have a free afternoon uh, i think i sleep every single day in the afternoon um, so that's been really huge like because then I, I feel fresh again for the afternoon practice or or the day after mm-hmm. um, and in the beginning people called me lazy and then they started trying to do it as well. And they, uh, they're like, how, how do you sleep at night? If you sleep like for four hours in the afternoon, I'm like, yeah, practice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everything else. <laughs> yeah. Practice make perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's pretty cool. And that's, that seems like a very good skill to have. Um, do you... it, 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 it can be kind of boring or lonely. Like some people, really want to be with, with, with friends and do stuff in the afternoon. And I'm like, yeah, sleeping is fine. Like all that comes after my meet. Right. <laughs> do you, I mean, with racing so much, you know, if you get to a big meet, like a, a Euro champs, a world champs, I mean, I know a lot of people when they taper, when they start resting, you know, it's harder to sleep because they're doing less in the pool. It does, does that ever affect you? Yeah, I, I sleep way less like during taper because I'm rested. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the hours like I'm laying down in bed or on the couch are, are still pretty much the same as before. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. So, so still, still working the recovery. Yeah, uh, like I think Netflix, I've watched like every, sh- every show like two times. So <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, and so just... Your day-to-day training, you know, when you're, let's say the last few months when you haven't been racing as much, um, how many, what is your weekly schedule like in terms of how many times, how many water workouts are you doing? Are you doing things outside of the pool as well? Uh, so we train 10 times two hours in a week. And bef- before every swim session, we do a half hour dry lens. And I do three times in the week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, weights after the morning session. Mm. Uh, and that's pretty much about it. So that's all. Yeah, it's like 30 hours a week. A lot. <laughs> yeah, it's like a full-time job. But yeah. I can see why you sleep so much. <laughs> um, yeah. And so do you have certain workouts during the week where you know those are going to be intense and then certain workouts where you know they're going to be easier? Mm, yes, no, of course, we have like the more tough and, and harder sets. But I think like one of the big things me and my coach can do, we are really good at like getting me on the edge of like going over my threshold mm-hmm. and, and keeping me there. So I think we don't really have like one or two uh, practices in a week, which are really tough. I think like it's more... 10 practices in a week are, are really rough. So I'm never like really exhausted after a practice more like at the end of the week, I'm like, oh, I'm dead. I, I need like 24 hours of sleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> and what else is the weekend for, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and so, so in, in a normal practice, what's, what is how many meters will you go? I mean, are you someone who who logs 8K in those two hours or is it, you know, more like 5K in two hours? I think in a normal week, we do over the 10 practices, like 50, 55K. Mm. Uh, but we don't really do a lot of freestyle. We do a lot of like IM work. 
and breaststroke. So it's it's pretty rough even to do a 50k because of all the breaststroke and the, and the butterfly we do. My coach loves butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, do you find that the IM work is helpful? And if so, why? Uh, it's helpful against like boring practice. because <laughs> I, I just can't do freestyle all the time. Mm. Uh, in the beginning, it was really like rough. And, I, and I, 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 I wasn't swimming well because it was way harder than all the freestyle work. Uh, but now I think like I'm I'm adjusted to it and I, I feel really strong like doing the doing the IM work. And I also do like a lot of freestyle with like breaststroke in between. Uh, so I don't have to do like the full hundred meters like in breaststroke, but just the turn or just like a 25 or a 50, which is also rough and tough, but like it, it's helpful. It's better than doing a whole hundred. Makes sense. Um, so do you have a favorite kind of workout or, so, you know, a style of training you really like, or, or a set that you've done in the last few months that was like, okay, that was a really good one. Or that one was one I really liked. Uh, I think like I used to hate like the, the, the four times 50 all out sets because I was really bad at those. Like up until a few years ago, I could do like. 31 32 34 36 <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I, I I'm better at those now I can I can like keep them at the same level uh, uh, I think one of the the, the the better sets was in Turkey like three weeks ago so we did like three times hundred from the block and the first one was uh, the, uh, go out like 90 percent and then uh, back all the way. The second one was like 90, 95 and the and the last one was like all out. Uh, and we were shooting for like 104, 103, 102. And I started the first one on 100 long course. So I was like, oh, nice. And then I, 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 I the second one was also 100. And the last one was, I wanted to dip the, the minute mark, but I, I did like 100.1. So oh. <laughs> it was still like an amazing set, but I, I really want to push that like minute mark, even in practice. Yeah. That is an amazing set, but I can, I can see why there's a little, little frustration. Yeah, sure. it stings. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so it's, it sounds like you're in a good place. You just made your Olympic team. Um, you know, I mean, I'm looking forward you had said that at world championships, you were ready for the final. Um, I mean, what do you, what are you thinking about for 2021 in Tokyo now? Well, I've some pretty, pretty fast times now. So like with those times I can like make the finals, but then again, like the breaststroke field is maybe the most stacked of all fields. So I really need to be on top of my game to like even make a final there. But then once you're in the final, as we saw in Rio at the 200, like if you're in the final and you have a lane, like you can win. It's it's that close. Yeah. The 100 may, is maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit different, uh, but, but still, like if you if you have a if you have a lane, like you can medal. Yeah, I it's, I mean, see, you bring up the hundred. Obvi obviously, the elephant in the room is Adam Peaty, who <laughs> is just you know leaps and bounds ahead of of the rest of the field as of now but i mean if you're thinking about is 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 that something is that a case where you look at him and see okay what is he doing how can i maybe apply that to my breaststroke or is that a case where you're just like i i have to focus on me and and be the best that i can and and hope that that can go up against him a little bit of both so for sure, I'm gonna look at NMPD. Like, what 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 does he do, and and like, how can he be this much much faster than than everybody else? But instead of like getting it into my program rhythm like straight away, you now uh, we'll sit down with my coach and we're gonna discuss like if th is is this something for me, or do we want to work on this or that, and and we're gonna make like a really good decision. Like, do we want to implement this in our training routine or not? Yeah, that's seem seems smart. 
because if, <laughs> if you just copy copy someone, you're never going to be better than that one. Dude, that that's a good point. And and like you said, breaststroke is is so personal. Yeah. And that's what make that that is what makes it fun. And certainly as a spectator, fun to watch as well. Um, so so to wrap things up, uh, just looking looking forward, you just qualified for your first Olympic team. These next couple of weeks, these next couple of months, especially with the uncertainty of competition, um, what are you looking forward to? What are you looking ahead to? Uh, well, first and foremost, I'm looking forward to some vacation and rest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's going to be in two weeks. Um, <laughs> and after that, I'm, I'm really looking forward to like being back at like practice and the grind and just, I know what to do now and I know how to, how to, how to get better and, and just like trying to push it every single day. And hopefully during the summer, we have, we have competitions again. Uh, we have some training games planned. So it looks much, much better than, uh, than the last couple of months. Even even if we have to do the last couple of months again, like I know I can do that as well now. <clears throat> Sorry, I have I have one more question. Um, do you train by yourself mostly? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. So I sometimes I do the same sets, but my freestyle isn't as fast as the freestylers in my team. Um, so I mostly do my own thing and I also train with Tess Schouten. So the girl who also made the Olympics teams are now in the breaststroke. So we do a lot of breaststroke sets together, uh, but then on different times and different like speeds. So, hmm. uh, I think mostly I train like alone. I've, I've talked to a few breaststrokers in the last couple of weeks who have said that breaststroke is the only stroke where you can truly train by yourself and and have it be okay because the one one reason that was given was because it's more of a feel stroke than a necessarily like a, an aerobic and shape stroke if you've got the feel you can get it what what makes it doable for you to train alone uh, alone like you do uh to be honest because like i'm a freak for like the details so <laughs> i i'm really pushing every single practice like to be better and, and, and into the details. So I'm so focused on that that I'm not even looking at the rest. That's cool. That's that's a that's a great stopping point for us, Arno. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me today. Any parting thoughts before we sign off? No, I think this was it. Yeah, it was really fun. And then thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.